since he mentioned my thesis, thank you very much. When I did a master's in Nottingham more than 10 years ago, uh, I wrote a thesis on inter-Korean relations, nuclear policy, and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, and I made a really, really, really prescient statement, which was that Kim Jong-il, having been to Seoul, uh, having, having met Kim Dae-jung in Pyongyang in 2000, would come to Seoul in 2002, I said. Watch out for this, I said. Um, and he didn't come, and he never came, and then he died. <laughs> it's not a good thing, but it is my first anecdote which can tell you why the people I work for, Deng and Kay, are important because they are determined to try and allow people to understand North Korea a good deal better than I did in the year 2000. Um, yeah, you're the first people I've ever told that. Please don't, don't pass it on. Um, when Andre Lankov was here, and I was not here, uh, he maybe claimed, and I wrote this down, that if you were to, and I thank you to Matthew, because I wasn't here, but I read it on nknews.org, um, if you were to look up North Korea, you would immediately learn that the country is an irrational, unpredictable, idealistically driven Stalinist dictatorship, and Andre Lankov is convinced that it isn't. To which I add, if you were to Google North Korean people, you might also learn that they are, what, automatons. People who cannot think, people who have no idea what's going on, brainwashed. Words like this will come out pretty fast. And that is also as untrue. Uh, and that is where my organization and many others start out from, with the belief that that is absolutely untrue. But I'm a little worried as I stand here, because although I wasn't at any of the previous uh, events the last four weeks. I am aware that you've had some really interesting people speaking. Uh, I believe you've had Kang Won Chol, followed by Kang Chol. Did you do this deliberately? <laughs> <laughs> These two people, very, very interesting people. Um, I'd like to be that interesting, but I wouldn't trade my life for theirs. There's no question about that. Uh, Andre Angle, everybody loves Andre Angle. I think he's the the most loved North Korea watcher in the world. Uh, one for us all to emulate. And then last week you had CK. Did he introduce himself as CK? No, no he used his full name? All right. Well, he's CK now. Uh, and he's been doing North Korea human rights work since before most of us were born. So, I'm afraid that this talk might not be that interesting. We might not reach those dizzy heights. But I do sense that NKNet is on a mission here. Uh, not just a mission to organize and to, to meet and to, under, to teach uh, foreigners here in Seoul about North Korea, but also maybe to reach a crescendo next week when Dan will be speaking. Don't miss that. That's the crescendo. Don't forget that. Um, but on the way there, to go from these really terrible stories of life in prison camps through Andre Lankov with his very deep understanding of North Korea, uh, through the North Korean human rights issue, more or less based in Seoul, in CK's case, and then through Daily MK, and me and other groups like Daily MK doing the same thing, and then onwards to what we can all do to improve the situation in North Korea. So, while it's not necessarily as interesting as life in Yodo prison camp, um, interesting is the wrong word, but I can't think of a better one, uh, I hope that we will all come away with some interesting information from this. Let's move on. What goes in, what comes out, and why it matters. What is information freedom in slash for North Korea? Well, in the context of North Korea, it is about getting information in and getting information out. It's very simple, and I, I won't labor the point. Getting information in uh, actually is all about domestic North Korean news, and getting information out is all about domestic North Korean news. Because, as you will be aware, the North Korean state news agency is absolutely useless at reporting anything worth hearing. Uh, and therefore, for anyone to learn anything about North Korea, unfortunately, people in Seoul have to do the work for them. Getting information in also includes international news, and it includes dramas and films and music and 
many other more interesting cultural things, which is uh, something that young people are much more interested in these days, even in North Korea. Uh, getting information out also includes North Korean interpretations of international news, because, uh, to reiterate, if you go on the KCNA website, you will learn that uh, it's, it's complete nonsense. Um, and especially the things that the North Korean government likes to tell its people are very, very different to the things that the North Korean government likes to pretend it tells its people. Uh, so that's important too. And then there's market information and things like that, which are very valuable. Actually, market information is valuable in both contexts. Uh, and I should probably have put it here too. Because the North Korean government treats market information as a state secret and doesn't pass it on to anybody. Uh, and in order for you to run a business in North Korea, you do need to know some things about the market, you need to know about exchange rates, you need to know about a bunch of very important things that previously, you were, uh, by previously I mean three years ago, you wouldn't have been able to find out any other way as a North Korean person. Now there are cell phones in North Korea and mediums of exchange of information which are making that dynamic a little different, but fundamentally, previously, this market information only circulated because organizations like my own and others allowed it to circulate. So this is what I consider to be information of freedom in slash for North Korea. That's the, uh, the baseline. Why do you, as a foreigner in Seoul, need to know this stuff? It's all about a better life. North Korea can give you a better life. Oh, seriously, better knowledge of North Korea leads to better understanding of North Korea and it will stop you writing a master's thesis in which you claim that Kim Jong-il is going to go to Seoul within the year, which is nice, because you shouldn't do that. That will lead to better advocacy, such as that being done by Daily NK, by NK Net, and by many other organisations, and hopefully also by you. Better advocacy leads to better policy, and better policy leads to a better life. So, as I just pointed out, it's all about getting a better life. But that's why you need to know this stuff. Why do the North Korean people need to know this stuff? Again, as luck would have it, the conclusion is a better life. Better knowledge of domestic and international news leads to, sorry, it's been out, leads to better understanding of the situation in which the North Korean people live, gives them better options on how to improve their lives, and, with any luck, it leads to a better life. So therefore, information freedom for North Korea leads to a better life for everybody except the leaders of North Korea. Which is why they do not like us very much. Let's move on. Okay, who the hell are you people anyway? I have divided the Information Freedom Gang into three groups. Most of them are based in Seoul, but some are based in the US. Outside of that, there's really not much else. The first group um, is not the biggest, but might be the loudest. It's Daily NK and Radio Broadcasters. Alluded to by Dan, one of them, Radio Free Choson was founded by NKNet, bit of a disclaimer. Much like Daily NK was founded by NKNet. People don't really know NKNet that well, but they do know all the things that they make. It's impressive. There are also four, actually, radio broadcasters, but these are the three most important. Open Radio for North Korea and North Korea Reform Radio. If you don't know Open Radio for North Korea, you might know Ha Taegyong, who is the president, chairman person of Open Radio for North Korea, and was he elected? He was, yes, he won. There we are, in the election down in Busan recently. So he will now be a lawmaker, uh, part of a slowly developing group of lawmakers with an interest in North Korean issues. Second group, which feeds the top group. I wanted to do kind of a food pyramid thing, um, but <laughs> Then I deleted my PowerPoint presentation. And, <laughs> that's, a, that's a true story. And urgency required me to choose this list option. But these guys feed us, Daily NK and radio broadcasters. 
NKNet is one, Citizens Alliance, and none of these are soul based organizations. But the ones I'm really talking about, although these are very important, the ones I'm really talking about in terms of in, uh, freedom of information are North Korea Intellectual Solidarity, North Korea Strategy Center, and as many as 40 other NGOs organized by defectors. Recently, Daily NK and a few others tried to work out how many there are. There are a lot, uh, and not all of them are, are as effective as these guys. So I put my two favorites on. Of favoritism. North Korea Intellectual Solidarity, uh, North Korea Strategy Center. I guess you might know North Korea Strategy Center because Kang Chol Hwan founded it. He did? Yeah, he founded it. He's certainly the president of it. Okay. And these guys do a good job of getting information out of North Korea. A lot of the information they get out of North Korea, they give to these guys. And these guys broadcast it in two ways. They broadcast it back into North Korea and they broadcast it to the international community. The broadcasting back into North Korea part is obviously done by the radio broadcasters because Daily NK, along with pretty much everything else, is impossible to see in North Korea. Um, but in any case, and then there's a third group, which is creative individuals. This is only half a joke. I'm sure that there's so many good ideas in this room, and I know that NKNet gathered people together here, partly because they were confident that there were some damn good ideas just waiting to get out. There's three main groups. So how do you do it then? Oh, and isn't it dangerous? All right. I want to tell you what every organization dedicated to North Korea does, but I can't. For time reasons and for knowledge reasons, I don't know. Uh, and the answer to the other question is yes it is, yes it is dangerous, but uh, that to me, to say it doesn't matter is much too frivolous, but it kind of doesn't matter, and I'll tell you why in a second. But first of all, what does Daily NK do? How do we get news out of North Korea? Daily NK has a team of about 20 people in Seoul, you can come to our office, you can come and see us very, very happily. Uh, we have 20 people. We have three, four defector reporters at any one time. We have a very small international department which runs the English web page. Uh, we have a bunch of people doing projects, various things that we might not necessarily broadcast publicly. But anyway, what we have is four defector reporters. At the moment, there are four. And these guys are from all walks of life in North Korea, because we want to cover the entire spread of life in North Korea. It's not easy, because a lot of the people who defect from North Korea come from places like North Hamgyong. Are those the vegetarian sandwiches? Look at that. <laughs> Very nice. Um, you can stick your hand up again, just in case he's forgotten. Who wants a vegetarian sandwich? No? Okay. A lot of the people who defect from North Korea come from places like North Hamgyong, South Hamgyong province, Jagando, uh, Yangkang province, and North Pyongyang province, uh, overwhelmingly so. As a result, it's a little hard to get diversity, but we do do our best. And more importantly, we aim for diversity of life. So we have one female reporter who used to work on a, uh, what do you call it, a cooperative farm in the middle of nowhere. We have had reporters who used to be party level we have to understand that doesn't make them bad people, but in North Korea, in order to make a secure life yourself, it's better to try and join the party. And the, the result is that some defectors do have that history, some from relatively high up. Um, one of my favorite defector reporters we've ever had, who recently left um, for the Ministry of National Defense. Uh, he was from Hesan, which you probably know is on the border there. Uh, just across the river from Changbai. He was from Hezhan, and he was a very, very smart man. He, he was in the military, and then he was plucked from the military because he seemed to be uh, sort of quite an intelligent fellow. And he was sent to Kim Il-sung Political University type thing, not in Pyongyang, uh, in the provinces somewhere, and trained to be a party cadre. Then he became a party cadre. And he, so having done all this, of course, at the time of his education, the entire country was going to hell in a handbasket. And as a result, by the time he actually became a party cadre, life was 
way worse than it would have previously have been. He's a very low-level party cadre. These are not the kind of people who get fantastic rations and you know, live high on the hog continuously. And he was sent, dispatched by the party to the water and sewerage uh, system in Hesse. And he was required to manage the water and sewerage system in Hesse, which is completely impossible because he was given no money, no resources, no equipment, and 28 men who were not being fed. Uh, so faced with this situation, he uh, took it upon himself, and in North Korea they do say that the, the people who really know how to survive did survive that period, and this is probably instructive of that. He took his 28 men and he said, right, we're either going to die or we're going to go and do something about this. So do something about it, they did. They went off to the mountains, and they collected the only thing that uh, was worth money in that region, which was medicinal herbs. And they gathered their system, which they developed over two years, was to gather two tons of medicinal herbs. And then our man, Mr. Lee, uh, had a partner in China. And all the two tons of medicinal herbs, and in the dead of night, he and a couple of his trusted men would take their two tons of medicinal herbs down to the river, just outside of Hesham, and then they would put the two tons of medicinal herbs on a tractor, tractor tire inner tube type thing. I don't think it was a tractor tire, because the tractors I've seen in North Korea don't have tires, but something similar. Then float it across the river, wait there for a few minutes, and back would come flour. So it was barter trading medicinal herbs for flour. And in this way, he successfully kept 28 people alive for two years. Um, after which he, alas, decided that he couldn't see a future in this activity. So he, uh, he decided that defection was better. And that was the end of the story. But in any case, these are the kind of fantastic, interesting people who work for Daily MK. And these people have other fantastic, interesting people inside North Korea whom they communicate with by cell phone. Normally Chinese cell phones, which you can buy on the street in China for less than $20. And uh, so you take the Chinese cell phones and then you route the call through China and you can speak to your, your uh, family members in North Korea or friends or acquaintances or whomever. So that's one method. We've got those four people who have the people they know in North Korea. Then we have three more people who are South Korean people working in China. Uh, the Chinese government doesn't really like it, but they, yeah, they're tolerant. Um, and those people have their own networks of people. And there are three people, right? So there's one in Xinhuiju, one not so far from Changhua, as far as I'm aware. I try not to learn these things because then I can't remember telling people in speeches. So I'm probably making this up a little bit. Xinhuiju, Changhua, and then up near Rasan, uh, but not quite that far north, Pedong area. And we have these people each have a network of people which they know inside North Korea, and by making cell phone calls to those guys, they can get information out. Now, I don't have any idea who they know. In fact, my president doesn't really have any idea who they know, and we don't want to know, but, and they don't tell each other, so there's three independent nodes of information in China. And they make phone calls, that's one method, getting information out, cell phone calls. Um, you can't use a North Korean cell phone, even now, even if it were not tapped or whatever, even if there were no security issues, we, they wouldn't do that. But in any case, they make cell phone calls and then they meet people coming out of North Korea, which goes in cycles. There are some times of year when lots of people get out of North Korea, and sometimes a year when nobody gets out of North Korea, but they do that too. Uh, uh, and then there are text messages as well get sent. And as you can see, through all of these things together, uh, you probably saw North Korea VJ a few weeks ago. I'm sure some people must have seen North Korea VJ a few weeks ago. Uh, there are some guys doing video stuff, but that is, that's Asia Press's department. We don't touch that. Um, so there's the, there's the methods of getting information out. Ah, yes, the more important question, yes, it is dangerous, but for 60 years, the North Korean people had no opportunity to tell their story. And now they do. And from the mid-2000s, 
they've suddenly been given an outlet for their rage, love, hate, tears, happiness, all of these things, and it turns out that they want to tell their stories. And even if we, with our you know, righteous moral sentiment, felt, well, we don't want to put you in danger. And we don't want to put them in danger, absolutely not. We go out of our way to avoid putting our reporters and everybody else in danger, but ultimately they want to tell their stories. Because that's what human beings want to do. So this question is becoming increasingly irrelevant because the people just want to speak, they want to be heard. It's unavoidable. Why does any of this matter? Why does any of this matter? I've got some case studies about why, without Daily NK, you wouldn't know what's going on in North Korea, really. Case study one I have prepared is Death of a Dictator. On the 17th of December, the best told story in the world, on the 17th of December, Kim Jong-il passed away on his train having worked his poor butt off for tens of years, decades even, uh, for the good of the people. Uh, he couldn't take any more, he keeled over and died. It was terribly, terribly sad. We know this to be true, because that is the Nodong Shinmun, the, the Workers' Party publication, the daily publication, from the day after his death. And as you can see, North Korea will never be the same again. Here is our smiling leader, blah de blah de blah, terribly sad, but it's all right, because he will always be with us. That was the official story from the North Korean government on uh, the death of Kim Jong-un. And it was very uninformative, it will come to. It's no shock to you to learn. But look at all the weeping. Look at all the weeping, everybody's very sad. KCNA, the Chosun Central News Agency, and images were broadcast around the world, not just by them, but predominantly by them, of people being very, very sad. Now we got a suspicion, I suspect, I certainly did, that some of these guys were perhaps not as sad as they were making out they were. I don't think you needed Daily NK to know that. Um, but, there was no way for us to learn this if it were not for the fact that Daily NK had some friends in the... You can't read this, I've realised this. I saved it as a PDF and it's just, it's just not come out that well. Harsh punishments for poor mourning, it says. The North Korean authorities have completed the criticism sessions which began after the mourning period for Kim Jong-il and begun to punish those who transgressed during the highly orchestrated morning events. Daily MK learned from a source inside North Hamgyong province on January the 10th, the authorities are handing down at least six months in a labor training camp to anybody who didn't participate in the organized gatherings during the morning period, or who did participate but didn't cry and didn't seem genuine. And it continues. The North Hamgyong source commented of the sessions, the criticism sessions, that they created a vicious atmosphere of fear, causing people to accuse that young upstart, Kim Jong-un, of preying on the people now that he has taken power. And so it continues. So that's why people cried, it turns out. So I should back up. Some people are probably a little sad that Kim Jong-un passed away. I don't know any of them but I'm sure there are some. And I would not begin to say that people didn't love Kim Il-sung back in the day. I don't want to touch that argument, did they, didn't they like Kim Il-sung. But I will say that this proves that a vast number of the people at Kim, Il Kim Jong-il's funeral and at other events broadcast around the world by KCNA and by uh, Associated Press uh, and a few other Russian and Chinese news agencies were not as sad as they made out. Fine! But how do you know you aren't the ones lying about this? It's a good question. It's a good question. It's our word against theirs. 
as it were. And we say they're not sad, we say they're just weeping because they have to. They say the people of North Korea are bereft and are still bereft. They're still bereft over the loss of Kim Il-sung, according to the North Korean government. So goodness knows what they're doing now, they've got two people more. But how do we, that's the key question, how do organizations like Daily NK know that we are right? As you saw from the article, there was one source from North Hamgyong province reporting the news, and you might justifiably say, and people have said in the past, that they're not convinced that what Daily NK and other organizations say is true. But this picture is just one example of how we do know. If you've ever been to Pyongyang, you may have been to a duck barbecue restaurant in the uh, Hedongang area of the city. And if you come out of the duck barbecue restaurant and you wander to the right, uh, you can find an apartment building, and in the basement of it, there is this sign, the Tedongang Guyok, uh, number 63 and 64 Inmin Ban, People's Units. Uh, people's Units, uh, as you probably do very well know in North Korea, are organizations of households um, in individual blocks or sets of houses, depending on the situation in which the people live. Uh, and these are an organizational unit, one of the lowest organizational units in North Korea, where people receive the information that they need to know from the government. And therefore, the information which is handed out at these events is relatively constant nationwide. Therefore, if someone from North Hamgyong province comes to us and says, on my phone, well, we received this information in this Friday's uh, People's Unit meeting, that X, Y, and Z is the case, then, in theory, someone else in Shenwiju should have received the same or similar information in their People's Unit meeting, and therefore we can cross-reference the information. That's one way that Daily NK sets about cross-referencing the stories that we receive, because there is uh, a reservoir of distrust that exists in this community. And it exists because in the 1990s when the first defectors started to emerge from North Korea, there was an element of the unreliable witness because it was to their benefit. It was to their benefit to not really necessarily tell the whole truth. They could exaggerate and extend their story. And this did happen. There's no point pretending it didn't. It did happen quite a lot. But nowadays, my point here is, nowadays there are many more defectors and there are many more connections in North Korea. And if you try, if as an organization, one is willing to try, then one can cross-reference information. And after cross-referencing information, we can broadcast it. To give you an example, on November 30th, 2009, the North Korean government decided to exchange their currency uh, at the drop of a hat without telling anybody, including the people, uh, exchange the currency, completely knock a few zeros off and start all over again, thus completely removing the wealth of a huge swathe of developing middle class families and individuals who had been working hard to build up their wealth in the market. It was just all taken away overnight. And Daily NK received, received a call, because the currency exchange was done at 9 a.m., or near enough when people got up, and Daily NK received a call in mid-morning, because a guy, one of our sources, had learned of this information, he had learned that this was about to happen, and he had rushed out of town, uh, and he had made a call to our man, um, at Daily NK, and at that point we had this information that the North Korean government had changed their entire currency and it had been a flash event and it was a complete disaster for a lot of people in the middle class, but we only had one person telling us that. So we needed to check it and that's why the information was not actually released as news until about 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon because we were calling people and trying to find out whether the same was true across the board, across the country, to see whether this story was real, which it unfortunately turned out to be. So this is one way the people's units, we can talk to people across the country, we can reconcile stories on individual things, uh, and with major stories it's particularly easy 
to cross-reference. With minor stories, it's harder, which is why when we have minor stories from places such as Pyongyang, places where there are not as many contacts, the further you go from the North Korean, Sino-North Korean border, the less contacts there are, because there's less defectors and less, anyway, less physical networks in those areas. And if there's a small story in a place like Pyongyang, then it's a little harder to cross-reference. And so there's a lot of stories that come through Daily NK's office that we don't report because there is a significant danger that they're not true. And we'd rather not report something that is true, within reason, than vice versa. You are still not convinced after my death of a dictator story? In that case, I have another story for you. Case study two, the building of an illusion. The illusion in this case is some new apartments which you might have seen. Goodness gracious me, it looks just like Singapore, one of the people I went to North Korea with said. More interestingly, some soldiers I saw, when coming into, when this came into view for the first time, said, wow, that's so cool, North Korean soldiers. Wow, that's so cool, they said. Pyongyang is really nice, they said. This is the propaganda value of these apartments, but, as you may know, some of them were built with, uh, well, all of them were built with military and student labor. You would also probably know that some universities were closed down in order to mobilize the students to build these, but that's not my story, although it is a story, and we did report it. Look, it looks nice, it's nice, isn't it? Look at that. Looks nice in the daytime too, uh, taken by me on the 15th of April, the 100th anniversary of the birth of Kim Il-sung. They look really good from a distance. And the North Korean government wants you to know that they are really good. Wants you to believe they are really good, and moreover wants the North Korean people to believe they are really good. But, as with all things, it's not quite what it seems. Hundreds dying on construction sites. This is just the beginning. During the construction process, uh, the source revealed, due to the speed of the work and insufficient safety measures at the construction site, college students, I can't read that word, with the word, uh, are suffering fatal accidents. And word has spread in Pyongyang that hundreds of college students have died. I can't guarantee that hundreds of college students have died because the North Korean government refuses to give enough news to the people to guarantee that that is true, but I do believe a significant number of people died on the construction sites, but that's not all. People living in unfurnished, home, unfinished, sorry, homes. A Pyongyang source explained to the Daily NK, originally there was no progress going on with new construction because of a serious shortage of materials, so they ordered the new construction to stop while the interiors of the finished apartments were dealt with. Despite this order, the work brigades lacked the construction materials to finish the interior construction, and so they started pushing it onto the residents, the source went on. Most of them are, I can't read that word either, are going on with the interior construction, having been told by the work brigades that they are just going to have to get on with it. So there were meant to be more apartments, but they stopped building them because they ran out of materials to build them, and they told the work brigades to deal with the interiors of the finished apartments, which do look very nice to reiterate, but they didn't have the materials for that either, so they just basically went, eh, do it yourself. Which is not quite what the KCNA and Nordon Shimon want you to believe. Not only that, and this is a quote-unquote favourite story of mine, the person who was responsible for the construction of these apartments within one government organ was allegedly... Uh, was he executed? I can't read it now. Anyway, he didn't come out of it very well. But the North Korean government does not tell you that he didn't come out of it very well. 
doesn't tell you what happened on the Mansube apartment construction. Simply, they want you to go to Pyongyang or look on the TV and think, wow, that's cool, it looks just like Singapore. Because it does look just like Singapore, unless you go inside. All right. Let's keep going. A watery grave. It's my third of four case studies into the value of organizations like Daily NK. A watery grave. What does this refer to? It refers to a dam. North Korea opens nation's biggest power station in the name of those people who suspect that the presence of Associated Press in North Korea is not doing anybody any good. I bring you news that this is an Associated Press story. I have no comment to make on that. That's for a different day. But North Korea on Thursday unveiled one of its biggest construction projects in recent years, a massive hydroelectric power station that is expected to provide the nation with, nation with much needed electricity. The opening of the Hichon power station in Jagang province, north of Pyongyang, was the first big ceremony in a month of celebrations timed for the April centenary of the birth of late President Kim Il-sung. It continues breathlessly to announce that the people of Pyongyang will receive the electricity from the Hichon Dam and that this should solve a lot of their current electricity shortage problems. Sounds good, doesn't it? Woo! Picture. That's very nice, isn't it? Look at that. This is the opening ceremony attended by State Premier Kim Yong-nam and, uh, and there's a band and a bunch of other people. And it all looks very splendid, and this was obviously broadcast by KCNA again. But, one of our reporters, Mok Yong-jae, uh, wrote a story taken from information gained from inside North Korea, saying that, unfortunately, uh, they had a ceremony for each on last September, but electricity has not yet been produced because of the transmission difficulties. Their transmission lines are not yet constructed at each on. So nobody has electricity. Uh, in essence, it's, it's a dam, but it doesn't make electricity. Just to make a long story short. A dam that doesn't make electricity. I'm not disputing that it might make electricity in the future. And I'm not disputing that it does look very, very pretty, but what it is not doing is what KCNA and Nordon Shimon want you to believe it's doing, which is making electricity for all of these people of Pyongyang. And finally, case study four. It's a chopper, not one of those 1980s bikes with a high back, but a helicopter, and some men with guns. Two recent-ish stories from Daily NK. One, the stuff they don't bother to try and tell you, they, being the KCNA and Nodong Jim and people like that, about how the North Korean Commerce Minister was killed in a helicopter crash while traveling to an island off the northwest coast of North Korea, uh, whereupon he was set to, and this is a a standard thing, year on year, was set to give gifts to the local residents to prove how much Kim Jong-il, who was not dead at that point, uh, well he was dead at that point, it was February 2012, how much he loves his people, or loved them in that case. But the helicopter, one of these aging Russian ones, came down into, uh, onto the island in the wind, and the air commerce minister was killed, as was as were four other people, I believe. And the only reason anybody knows this, because it was not broadcast by the case they all know uh, is because someone called one of our people and that information came out that way and we wrote a report about it that afternoon. And that's the only reason that anybody knows that this, the death, about the death of the Commerce Minister the North Korean Commerce Minister. That's one example, the stuff they don't bother to try and tell you, and the stuff they think it might be better if you didn't know. This is quite a recent story, so I guess you might have heard it, but it is the story of two armed North Korean border guards. They actually weren't border guards, it later turned out. 
proving that our news gathering method is far from perfect. Uh, we actually got that bit wrong. Anyway, two armed North Korean gentlemen uh, escaped into China across the border at, at Hesam because uh, they had killed six or seven, again we're not quite sure, of their comrades uh, and run away. Apparently this was for personal reasons, but we don't have any verified evidence of this. Anyway, they ran away to China. The Chinese government didn't report it centrally either, uh, but the Chinese government did order all the people in the local area to stay indoors. And as it happened, one of our people was in Chiang Mai at that time, and he reported this story to us. We didn't get this from inside North Korea, but the Chinese media are not quite as restrictive as the North Korean media, but they're not exactly prone to telling the truth all the time, either. Uh, and this guy in Chiang Mai reported this to us, and the two border guards ran into China. They stayed there a few days. We didn't receive the news until a few days after it happened. They stayed there a few days. The North Korean government dispatched people into China to track them down. The people in Chiang Mai were ordered to be careful not to travel in certain areas at night, blah de blah de blah and then finally, they were arrested and repatriated. And all of that, uh, you wouldn't know from reading Xinhua, the Chinese news agency, and you wouldn't know from reading KCN either. So, my conclusion from all of this is that without organizations like DNK, without organizations like Open Radio for North Korea, Radio Free Chosen, North Korea Reform Radio, uh, North Korea Intellectual Solidarity, none of this would be known to anyone. And that's why it matters. But that's why it matters to you and me. Uh, but also it matters to the North Korean people. And it matters to the North Korean people. This doesn't. This is just very, very interesting. But when we talk about market information and all those things I mentioned earlier in the talk, these things are very, very important. Oh, look at that. That's the last one. So, I'm not going to continue yabbering about different cases about how Daily NK does a great job of obtaining information from inside North Korea. But I hope that you understand why it's very important for us to keep doing it. And I hope you understand why next week, when Dan and Joanna from Citizens Alliance, right, stand up here and say, how can we help? that you'll realize that helping is really, really, really important. Uh, and there, the entire thing from talking to defectors, talking to people born in prison camps, talking to the lovely, lovely, lovely Andre Langhoff, Professor Andre Langhoff, talking to Database Center for North Korean Human Rights last week, and then talking to me this week, will have inspired you to do whatever it is Dan plans to demand that you do. <laughs> and I look forward to finding out because I've got a job and I won't have to do any of it. <laughs> Alright, I think I'm done for the time being. But I'm hopefully, I hope there will be many questions. Okay, Dan, you got anything to say? Jingo, you got anything to say? No? Okay, if anyone has a question, please ask it. Yes? Um, how is information circulated in North Korea that might be information that the government doesn't put out immediately? Like you said, for instance, the... Um, piece of information about the helicopter cra crash, killing the, the minister or whatever. Um, how, I mean, do you, does the Daily NK have any sense of how people in North Korea talk to each other and share information that maybe the government doesn't want them to share? What a splendid question. The answer is markets. I believe the answer is markets. Uh, and I think a lot of people also, who's that? Should I, I, this, is, this, is, this is my wife, by the way. <laughs> anyway, markets. Yes, markets. Uh, the North Korean government doesn't want people uh, to talk. And that is why, as the books of Marcus Noland and Steph Haggard will have informed us already, the markets are the most dangerous thing in North Korea today. Because not only do people in the markets need to know some stuff, like the price of rice in another city, uh, where DVDs can be obtained, which they can sell for a vast profit, blah de blah, and so on and so forth. But also, information that goes with that. That's the main locus of information spread in North Korea today. People 
I'm giving you market information on the price of rice. The price of rice is quite expensive. Why is it so expensive? Well, do you know what just happened here? And that means no one can smuggle anything across the border. Oh, really? So what are the Chinese guys saying about that? Well, they say you're going to have to just wait a little while. Maybe next week things will get better. Next week. So that means next week the price will go down. You can see how this works, right? So this is, a, this is how this information really spreads in North Korea today, particularly in the cities. Uh, I wouldn't dispute that there's still a large amount of ignorance, quote unquote, in the countryside where this kind of uh, system doesn't really exist as well, but that's what I would say is the, the best answer I can give you to that question. That's how information spreads in North Korea. Yes? Yeah, I want to know, uh, I've got to work with Huang uh, Jamil and what was it like? Uh, to say I worked with Huang Gang Yop is probably an overstatement. I met the man three times in my life. Uh, he was inspirational to almost all my colleagues. That's what I'll say. And I like my colleagues and I respect my colleagues. And that leads me to the belief that he was a great guy. Because otherwise they wouldn't have liked him. But I think he, is, he was a very good man who had some very good ideas. And I think he was a grandfather figure to the North Korean human rights movement. Not necessarily to South Korean people, as much as to the North Korean defectors that came out. So there is much to be thankful that he, he came out for. The flip side of that is he died in 2010, of course, and the North Korean defector movement has yet to find a talisman to replace him, uh, which is, I think, something that they're still doing today. That's the first one. Yes. You mentioned uh, North Korean citizens having limited access to cell phones and even some text messaging. Are you aware of any uh, internet presence, any online connectivity, email? With the exception of that, uh, I'm aware of stories that in Pyongyang, limited internet connectivity is technically possible on cell phones, but I'm not aware of anyone having the ability to use it. Uh, with the exception of the very high leadership, who presumably do have very good access to the internet. But no, I, the answer to your question is basically no. Um, we see a lot of paranoia going on between the defector's testimony, between the opinion that comes along with the testimonies in Barbara Denmark's books, uh, and just on news, news sites and organizations about paranoia to uh, uh, talking with any other individual, and this, even if it's a, a close family member, how do you planning to affect, uh, if, if they say that to anyone, like they risk their lives? Um, from what P Professor Langkov was talking about, about or, I'm not sure if you read the full text of his speech. I read as much as I could. Uh, he, he was talking about how the younger generation is no longer relying entirely on the, uh, on the government for uh, planning out their lives and that they think that there's a different way possible through the markets and uh, private capitalism. Um, do, you, do you feel that in the last uh, seven years or ten years uh, there's been a shift away from that paranoia? Like, well, I feel like that paranoia is still probably very present, but maybe more open to uh, conversing about Distrust of the government. Uh, I'm not aware of anyone willingly conversing about distrusting the government in North Korea. I'm aware of people criticizing things indirectly uh, and by cr implicitly criticizing the government, since the government organizes a great many things. But I'm not aware of anyone ever saying anything directly critical of the government to anyone around them. It's not to say it doesn't happen, but I don't think that would ever get as far as my ears. Mm. Yes. Do you provide any form of payment to the sources, and has anything ever happened to the sources? That's a great question, uh, and one which harks back to the unreliable witness problem that we discussed earlier. In short, yes. Uh, speaking more generally about the, the groups like mine, uh, Journalists, people who are willing to be citizen journalists in North Korea, do receive payment for what they do. Uh, we have not had any cases of disastrous things happening to our sources. 
There was one interesting story where a source from Pyongyang went out of the city and up towards Chongjin for some kind of business. So this guy was a trader, so he, he was semi-mobile. He went up to Chongjin and uh, he got himself arrested and we don't know why. Uh, it wasn't anything to do with anything that, any stories, any news, anything like that. But he got himself arrested and in North Korea, if you're arrested in your, in your neighborhood, in your home area where people know who you are, you can usually pay your way out of trouble. But if you go somewhere where you don't know anyone, you lack that network and you can't necessarily pay your way out of trouble. So this guy who got in trouble, uh, for whatever it was he did, did go to a labor re-education camp. And he's still there now, and as a result, even though it had nothing to do with us, uh, the organization in question does support his immediate family and will continue to do so until he is, he is uh, released, whenever that may be. Yes, back on. Hi. Um, a few months ago, I think it was, your site had a bit of a problem with the cyber attack. Mm. You know? um, is that quite a common feature since you've been working on the site? And, so I know you joked about security, but um, daily integrity seems to be one of the main enemies. <laughs> yeah, security is a problem. Um, we joke about it because it's kind of, we don't feel that we have much choice but to joke about it because Daily NK, as you know, is to all intents and purposes an NGO with limited funds and the kind of security that we would have to implement to actually stop that kind of thing happening permanently, it's, 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 it's beyond imagination. So it does happen uh, and we do our best to, to, to shift around and try and avoid it. Hi. Uh Andrew Lankoff said that in the end it will be markets which um, bring the whole edifice of uh, North Korea to come tumbling down. Do you think uh, from your side that information will also be the general flow of information in, into and out of North Korea will be also partnered with uh, uh, the, the markets? Absolutely. I see, I see the markets as having laid the foundations for that flow of information. And it'll take a very long time, as I'm sure Andre Lampen was quick to point out. I don't doubt that he said it may take tens of years to make this kind of progress. Uh, but he, he would have pointed out that, yes, the information circulates because of the market, because of the question I, I answered earlier. Yes, so me, me, me and Andre are in agreement on this matter, as I think for a lot of people nowadays. I think, I think Andre Lampen's view has become one of the prevailing views in in the analytical community these days, yeah. Hi. Um, do you know why are there so many different defector radio stations now? There seem to be four or maybe five different um, groups in Seoul that are kind of broadcasting. Is it is it uh, safety in numbers, or would it be better for them to kind of combine their, their energies? That's a difficult question. Uh, North Korea, when I ask people about this, and I have done before, they say North Korean people, by virtue of their history, don't trust one another. That's why they suggest, one of the reasons why there's upwards of 40 NGOs run by North Korean defectors operating in Seoul today. Because every, not everybody, but someone comes out, they don't want to hang their hat with another person who's already established an organization. They want to set up their own organization, and part of that is because they don't trust the guy who's gone before. Um, unfortunately, that's not the whole story. The other part of the story is that in the current environment, it's not always easy for defectors to make good money in Seoul. It's a very competitive place, and they haven't had the kind of brutal education that a lot of Korean people have had. And some of them do see a path in set up NGO, get funding from wherever, and then I will have, have succeeded. I'm not saying this is a prevalent situation, but it does happen. They don't really have the goal in mind. They have the idea of, of making money by owning an NGO in mind. And I think those two factors together uh, lead to the situation we found. Do I think that there could be a bit of a rationalization, a little bit of pooling of resources? Hell yeah, I think that would be a great idea. 
Um, but I, nobody seems to think it's going to happen in a hurry, unfortunately. Yes, go. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry if you mentioned this before. The sources in North Korea. Are they, um, how do they become sources? Are, do they first come to the Daily MK, or does the Daily MK somehow seek out people that they think would be willing to divulge information? What is the process? Hmm. Um, some of them are, as I said, uh, family members, acquaintances, and friends. So it's pre-established networks. Others, well, there's a, there are programs run by organizations which are intended to train North Koreans outside North Korea to become journalists who will then return. I mean, Asia Press, as I said, Ishimaru Jiro is, is doing that kind of thing. Um, and basically, if a person can leave North Korea, if a person can leave North Korea and you meet them in Handong, say, that proves that they can get a license to leave North Korea. Which is not necessarily true for everyone, of course, it's quite a, quite a privilege. If you can get a license to leave North Korea, then evidently you can get another one later, and that makes you a good target, potentially, for training as a, as a journalist. So certain groups do this. They, they, there are very few places where most North Koreans go when they leave North Korea. They go to certain hotels, they stay in certain places, they do their business in certain areas, and they're quite easy to meet if you know where those places are. So people go and they meet them. People from our side, not the AK side, but our side, go and meet them and ask whether any of them have the desire to do this, to be a journalist. And then some of them will be trained. In other cases, people who never leave North Korea are, I guess, sought out by contacts within the network inside North Korea. Um, but how that happens, I couldn't possibly say. Because I don't know. Yes? Back in 2009, when uh, Laura Ling and Emma Lee mm -hmm. were uh, arrested across the border to the Chinese border, uh, doing their uh, documentary work or yeah. journalism work, um, did, you, uh, did you, with the Daily MK, have your network of sources disrupted to any significant impact? Not that I remember. Uh, I know that there were a lot of uh, defectors and NGOs in South Korea that were extremely upset at the uh, irresponsibility of, of the two journalists. Oh, we were very upset at their irresponsibility too. Um, I think it probably caused us to ask people to redouble their efforts and be more careful and bloody blah blah and so on. But I don't remember it interrupting our ability to disseminate news. Let's put it that way. Um, within the context of the recent uh, missile failure and the United States' subsequent termination of food aid, do you see North Korea's future as ending in sort of a, a more cataclysmic way, or continuing along this sort of slow loosening of information, maybe past a fourth generational replacement of leadership? It strikes me that for North Korea to achieve a smooth transition to something else, whatever that something else may be, would require an awful lot of things to go well. Uh, I hope that happens, and I'm not discounting the possibility that it will, but it doesn't take much for it to tip over into the alternative that we're all trying to avoid. So I guess if I were a betting man, and I'm not, then I'd put my money on a, an ugly ending, but that's why we're all supposed to be working so hard to try and avoid making that happen. Hello. I know it's unlikely, but uh, I know quite a lot of information about South Korean society has leaked into North Korea. Mm -hmm. Have your sources been able to tell you maybe how widespread that knowledge is? Um, you know, how many people know? Maybe how many people have watched DVDs? Of course, I'm sure a lot of them won't be willing to share that, but I don't know if you could know that at all. Most of that kind of information comes from the 23 odd thousand defectors now in South Korea. And I know that NK Net, correct me if I'm wrong, stop taking pictures, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys did a survey, right? Um, food distribution survey, but you, you're you not the only organization doing surveys of defector opinion on whether people have watched DVDs, how often they watch DVDs. Such information is definitely available, but that kind of survey doesn't really get done inside North Korea too often. Simply, 
3,000 defectors coming out each and every year allow for you know, additional surveys each and every year of what they've done, what they've seen, and how they do it, and where they do it, and so on and so forth. So that's where that information normally comes from. Um, in the same vein as the rocket launch, I know that the North Korean media has a history of just not reporting stories that don't do well for it. So do you know how the North Korean media responded to the rocket launch failure? Did they say it was like the American capitalists jamming the radars or whatever? What, how did they report the failure? That's a fantastic question, and it's something that has really, really annoyed me recently. Um, as you know, immediately after the rocket launch failure, four hours later, the North Korean media reported on TV that they didn't report that the rocket had failed and blown up after two minutes and scattered in the yellow sea in a million pieces, but they did report that the, the uh, satellite it carried had failed, quote unquote, failed to enter orbit. And that was surprising to a lot of people because it represented a certain degree of openness that one would not otherwise have expected which raised questions of why did this happen? Did it happen because there were so many international journalists in Pyongyang at the time? Did it happen because those journalists had so many minders that this information was guaranteed to leak out anyway? There were many questions and not so many answers, and there still aren't terribly many answers as to why the North Korean media decided to report that all of a sudden. But then, a few days ago, I guess, no, the end of last month, 26th, I think it was, one news organization, released a story saying that uh, the local authorities, security forces in a university in Pyongyang were looking for people who were spreading the malicious rumor of the failed satellite launch, which was not a failed satellite launch at all, it was a success, etc. Et et um, and this was obviously completely contradictory to the story of the, the North Korean media actually reporting them the launch failure. And it turned, and the story hinged on the idea that the North Korean media, or the North Korean authorities, had made a news report and broadcast it, but had deliberately organized for every single satellite, TV, signal, relay station in the entire country to be switched off simultaneously so that the North Korean people couldn't see the broadcast which they themselves had just made, during which they didn't even actually tell the truth they simply said that the satellite had failed to enter orbit. And I looked it up at this and I thought, wow, that's just nonsense. And I thought it's nonsense for two reasons. First of all, I was in Pyongyang on the day after the failed satellite launch. And on the 15th, so two days after it, I was stood outside the USS Pueblo, the American spy ship taken by the North Koreans in 1960. And I'd been there before. Uh, and I didn't want to see another propaganda video. Uh, I'd seen enough. Um, and so I stood outside the, the Pueblo talking to our guides. And one of them came up to me, and he, he didn't speak English. There were so many international observers and tourists in North Korea at that time that there weren't enough guides to go around. So some English-speaking groups ended up with non-English speaking guides. But every, every group had one English speaking guide. It's beside the point. This guy ran up to me and said, what do you think about the satellite launch? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, I saw it on TV. Oh, that's a bit odd. You saw it on TV, so they told you. And they said, yeah. So, no, I didn't say they told you. That would be awful. I said, so you, everybody knows about that then? He said, yes, everybody knows about that. And he said, what do you think about it? And we had a conversation about this. And it was a very politicized conversation. But it was a conversation nevertheless. And we came to the conclusion that launching satellites is hard. Launching rockets is hard, other countries fail, South Korea's failed twice, and in the future it'll certainly work out just fine. And it's just simply a matter of time before they get it right. And he said, yes, because our country doesn't have many resources and we're doing the best we can. So we had a great conversation about this, it lasted around five minutes, very nice, very nice conversation. So when I saw this report saying that the people had not seen it, uh, seen about the, the, the launch, I thought, hey, that's nonsense. But I'm prepared to accept that Pyongyang is different to the rest of the country. So what I'm going to do is a little survey. So I did a survey in my office. I said to people, the people you've spoken to in North Korea in the last few days, did they know that the satellite launch failed? And they all said, yes, 
Everybody knew that the launch failed. How did they know? I asked. They saw it on TV. They were told. So, your question relates to something that's been annoying me for a little while. I don't think this represents a sudden shift to openness as the North Korean government is about to launch a reformist drive. I was the person who in 2000 and whatever said that Kim Jong-il is going to go to, to, to Seoul the next year. So I've already had my fingers burnt on that kind of thing. But I will say that when the North Korean government does something which is marginally better than what the North Korean government normally does, I'd like to say well done. Because just a little bit of encouragement might be helpful. I don't know if I answered your question. It's a very long story, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's a relief. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm sorry. Um, a follow up to my last question. Um, hmm. Do you think maybe you could just comment briefly on how many um, how many defectors have said they've, they've, they've um, about their experience with South Korean media or just you know international media? Oh, okay. I'm just afraid of lying to you. I I, I when I was in Kaesong just two weeks ago. Um, I tested the ability to listen to radio stations. Uh, we were at a statue of Kim Il-sung, and I was bored of statues of Kim Il-sung, so I whipped out my iPod, and I wandered off into a corner, and I was listening in. I was only listening to FM radio. I don't have shortwave, which is disappointing, because these defector radio stations broadcast on shortwave. Uh, but I could hear three stations in case I could hear KBS, and NBC, and... Uh, free North Korea radio, which is a source of some confusion, because that, as far as I'm aware, is a shortwave radio broadcaster, and I was listening to it on FM 97.7. Um, but in any case, three, I could hear three. And then I tested it again on the highway back to Pyongyang, and it was fuzzier, but I could still hear them. Really, KBS is tremendously annoying and just full of advertisements, and I thought, <laughs> NBC too, we need to improve the programming, is what I learned from that. But anyway, I could hear these three stations. As far as I'm aware, and I hope that Dan will stop me, or Jingle will stop me, or Sogil Park in the corner will stop me if I'm lying, but the number of people who have seen DVDs or heard radio stations is still quite small. Very loath to put a finger, uh, figure on it, but certainly less than 20%, and probably quite a lot less. Part of the reason for this, and it's a very, very more important point possibly, is that when I was there, and I checked my three radio stations, and full of advertisements and tremendously annoying though they were, they were crystal clear. And one of the main things that people who have heard radio stations inside North Korea do say is, if the quality were better, I might listen to it more. Because it's on shortwave, and it's broadcasting in some cases from places as far as where it's Kazakhstan. So it's inevitable that the quality is going to be quite low. And Admittedly, on the one hand, there's a problem that young people don't like listening to radio anymore. In that context, they're just the same as Western young people. They'd rather watch TV or DVDs or whatever. But in any case, they do say, if it were better, if the quality of programming were better, and if the quality of the signal were better, I would listen to this much more. Which leads me to believe that in order to increase that annoyingly low figure, what we need is more money for programming, and the ability to broadcast on FM. The South Korean government, alas, for whatever reason, and again, that's for another day, don't allow FM broadcasting by defector radio stations. If they did, they would, of course, be inciting the ire of the North Korean government, but uh, I think it could make a big difference. I think that's actually the takeaway. The number of people who listen to it is a function of why they can't hear it better. Yes. Um, when I, when I uh, first started getting interested in learning about human rights in North Korea, the first thing that uh, that myself or anyone else would discover is that they're very poor, life is very hard, um, and it's just full of hardships all around. Um, but then the more, like, the more reading you do, the more research you see, and you, you start seeing that people have radios that they can uh, Hack into and listen to South Korean radio. They have, they have TVs that they can watch around. Um, and you find yourself thinking, well, I thought it was such a poor country. How are they getting TVs? Um, 
And I, I'm curious, like, you, you mentioned that it was probably less than 20 percent I've seen these dramas and DVDs. But in, in your thoughts, what do you what do you think are the percentage of people who uh, have TVs even if they don't have electricity for it? Does any people who have TVs? Uh, well, given that the North Korean government, one of its main forms of propaganda dissemination is television, it's in their interest to ensure that the maximum number of people own a TV. So, from my understanding, the vast majority of people, a majority of people, have a TV or access to a TV. Uh, what is the history of this organization being Daily NK? Yeah. Hmm. <coughs> uh, I didn't mention that because it's not that dissimilar to the history of the organization Dan mentioned at the beginning, NK Uh The president of Daily NK is Park In Ho. And Park In Ho was uh, uh, an ultra leftist, I think is the only way I could reasonably put it, in the 1990s. Juche ideology follower. Uh, and it was at the time of the famine, the mid 90s famine, that not only President Park Geun Hoon, not only the founders of Daily Earth, AK Net, but also a bunch of other people besides, including Ha Tae Gyeong, who I mentioned earlier, the recently elected Ha Tae Gyeong. And they all saw the famine footage coming out of North Korea, and they, they felt that something was very wrong with this picture. And one of the main reasons I respect them is because they then thought, well, clearly what I thought was nonsense. Uh, and I'm, I'm thinking that going the other way might be the way forward. So they turned 180 and they started doing the, uh, the, 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 the activities that they do now. So that's the history of, of Daily NK. And then they launched Daily NK on December 30th, 2004, as I recall and have been developing it ever since. They've launched with six people, um, and now they have 20, and they didn't have any foreign until 2007, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's where, that's the root of the company, which I think is probably the important part of your question. Yes, we got a few questions. Okay. Um, What's your relationship like with major news agencies, like uh, national news agencies, CNN, BBC, New York Times, and also how do they see Daily NK and also get their information about it, which all seems to be the same. International news organizations like us. They like Daily NK, they like all the other groups as well, because they don't feel a sense of competition. But there is an element of feeling among South Korean major news organizations that they are achieving less in terms of North Korean news with considerably greater resources, I would say. Speaking personally, and based on anecdotal evidence, there seems to be that feeling. Uh, whereas international news agencies, as I say, have, have none of that kind of feeling, because they're not trying to get inside North Korean news, and they just admire us, and they come to our office and they say, what, you run Daily NK out of this? And we go, yes. <laughs> yes, thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> and then what's the, um, you know, the utility of the news and the information that you have, what's the utility of that to the wider world? Um, and how do you think that information can be used more effectively if you know, more people know about it? Or how do you see the information being most useful? The utility of it to a wider world is because it gives you a better life, <laughs> as I previously mentioned. Um, there is a huge difference between one political party's uh, planned policy for North Korea and another political party's planned policy for North Korea. But at least they're all starting from some kind of baseline of knowledge, which until the 1990s, and certainly until the end of the 1990s, nobody had. And I think that knowledge comes from organizations like Daily NK. And you can't make a policy without knowledge. Or well, you're just guessing. You might as well close your eyes and just say anything, the first thing that comes into your head. So I think that's the utility of daily NK's material. It's very interesting for everybody else too, but it's useful for those reasons. What was the second half of your question? Did I answer it all? Yeah. All right, great. Yes. 
I know you said earlier you didn't touch on it, but with the AP Bureau now in government, do you ever get a sense they could um, in any way do anything like that? Do you ever get a sense that they will build networks or get any kind of information from that? It's fast about happen, but... I don't think they're going to get the chance. I don't want to say that AP shouldn't be. You've made me talk about it now. I don't want to say that AP shouldn't be in Pyongyang. In fact, I think they probably should be in Pyongyang. Um, but they should be very well aware that they are projecting institutional credibility upon the words of the Korea Central News Agency. Previously, Everybody knew that the Korea Central News Agency was the Korea Central News Agency. The Korea Central News Agency report had to be doused in a huge mountain of salt before you could take it in. Uh, there is a danger that Associated Press, as you saw with the Heechon Power Plant article, will end up parroting precisely what KCNA wants them to say. Uh, I'm sure that people here would have read One Free Korea, the, uh, the blog of Mr. Joshua Stanton, uh, who is a, a lawyer in Washington, D.C. And he has much more than me, and a lot more vitriolically, to say about the AP relationship with North Korea. I just, I, I, I just think a little circumspection is required on the part of AP themselves. That's all I'm saying. Yes. Uh, I almost forgot to ask this. Um, what form, or what uh, sites, uh, sources, what what do you find with the what do you find yourself reading in forms of analysis? Um, well, my job with Daily NK is pretty much everything to do with English, and that does include editing. I mean, I'm a translator, I'm an interviewer, I'm an interviewee, and I'm a writer of stories, and therefore I end up reading literally everything that goes through Daily NK's hands. Um, outside of that, the reason why I put North Korea Intellectual Solidarity, the reason why I put North Korea Strategy Center, the reason why I mentioned those groups is because I have found them to be informative and helpful in my own understanding. So the, pe the people I put up there in my PPT are the ones I would prioritize. In addition, I do read Nodong Jinmun and I do read AP reports sent out of Pyongyang. Um, I try to cover everything as far as I possibly can. Sorry, yes. Back. No, no, please. Yes. Can I ask, um, have, you seen, have you seen less information coming out since Kim Jong un came to power? Or has that actually created more information and more people talking about the new leadership? And, uh, uh, has there been, in, since December, more people complaining, I know, the, complaining about the regime, but sort of talking more critically about the regime since Kim Jong un? Power or, have you noticed any sort of trends or changes since the transition? The North Korean government has been at great pains to try and limit the amount of information getting out of North Korea since Kim Jong Il passed away at the end of December, uh, with varying degrees of success. It is true to say that it is now harder to talk with people inside North Korea than it's been for quite some time. Um, we do make phone calls, we do get phone calls, but specifically we appreciate that where your map of North Korea, the, the border down by Shinliju Dan Nong is by far the most populated area, and therefore it's the place where the authorities will concentrate their attempts to stop information getting out. Uh, the further east you go towards Rasan, the easier it is to make contact with people inside North Korea. Um, but yes, I would say that the government's jamming efforts, radio jamming efforts, and all of those, the, the, the various tools that they employ to try and limit the outflow of information, have been somewhat successful in this calendar year. Of your sources or the people that help you in North Korea, is there, are there common characteristics about those people? Or I guess I'm wondering, like, what type of person steps up to do this? What type of person steps up to do this? Um, common characteristics would probably be something really amorphous that won't help you, such as the desire to tell their story. But we have people, uh, women who work in the market, 
therefore they have more money, therefore they own cell phones. Men who are party functionaries, low-level party functionaries, and they can see that the party they joined isn't the party that they thought it was or that they would like it to be, and they are angry. They would like to tell their story to that reason. Um, so yeah, a desire to tell the story and the energy to tell the story that the North Korean authorities don't want to be revealed is the only common characteristic that we easily say. Education? Education level, somewhat more educated. Somewhat, probably what you would have guessed actually, more educated because people who are less educated don't know what they're missing, to put it in a very broad term. Uh, so yes, normally school education, university education, is relatively common. Hi. Hi. Uh, since markets have become such a big deal, there, especially with the spread of information, did you did you run into any problems when there was a crackdown by the government a few years ago on markets, where a lot of the frog markets, like informal markets, were shut down completely, uh, and then were brought back? I mean, they've come back in force lately, but did you run into any problems when that happened, as far as information getting out or being spread? A few years ago means what era would you say? Wasn't that 2000? You mean post currency redenomination? Yes. 2009? Or yes, 2009. Because okay. there was a, you know, 2005 was also a bit right. of a hard time as well. All right, let's talk about 2009. Um, well, they closed down the markets entirely, of course. Right. Uh, but that didn't really cause problems for people with cell phones. I guess it probably caused problems with the density of networks of information that people were able to access in order to report. But I that was more of the question that then, like, people with cell phones, but more of the, do you think you missed out on a lot? Because the information just wasn't spreading that way. I think we miss out on a lot all the time. Yes. Uh, potentially. I don't, I don't know what we missed, but it would, would surprise me greatly if we didn't miss something. Yes. Uh, but as I say, we miss things all the time. And our, our information is fragmented at best, even now. I can't give you a better answer. I know that I'm, I know I'm fudging your question, but it's the, it's the best I can do, I'm afraid. And, oh, yes. Um, have changes in South Korea's domestic politics had much effect on, on the daily NK's ability to work? I know you started in 2008, but do you know in the Sunshine Era, when, was it much more difficult to do the sort of reporting that you do? The opinion of the president of Day NK is that the left and the right both say they want to help North Korea, but neither of them really wants to help North Korea. He doesn't see any great difference between the two. Uh, during the Sunshine Policy era, the South Korean government refused to help organizations like Day NK. During the Emil Bak government era, the South Korean government refuses to help organizations like Day NK. Which is why, for better or worse, our baseline funding for us and a great many other organizations comes from the United States. Because they're a little bit more democracy promotion oriented and are less about domestic politics. I kind of understand why the South Korean government slash governments don't want to help organizations like this. It's a very, very sensitive topic. Um, but yeah, there it is. It doesn't really make much difference. But have they interfered? Uh, like, for instance, when you contact people in North Korea, um, do you, doesn't that run afoul of the national security law? That doesn't run afoul of the national security law, but, well, yeah, they, they, I, suppose you, I suppose you could say they do get in the way because they, they uh, illegalize the reading of KCNA, they illegalize the reading of Nodong Shinwood. And as Andre Lankov says much more eloquently than I ever could, if the man on the street in Seoul or anywhere else could pick up a copy of Nodong Shinwen and read what the North Korean government is publishing, then there wouldn't be a supporter of North Korea and South Korea left, because it's laughable. Uh, so from that perspective, yes, the South Korean government does interfere with our activities, but on a practical day-to-day -day level, no, they just live and let live kind of attitude. Yep, Connor. Okay, um, you mentioned most of your sources come from the Northland government. Um, the historical image is always of Pyongyang as the show city on the outskirts is ignored. Um, have you sensed any change in that, or have you sort of mentioned any change in their regions, or is it still very much um, left to fend themselves up? 
uh, still very much left to fend for themselves. Um, Kim Jong Un gave a speech at the end of April in which he said that Pyongyang must be run fabulously as what the, the centre of the revolution and as a global city, etc. And from that perspective, he said it's perfectly right for the majority of investment to be to be focused on Pyongyang. But he also said that regional cities should be run uh, better and should be improved. Uh, and I must say that when I was in Nampo recently and when I was in, passing through Shinliju on the train, I did sense, because I went to North Korea in 2006 before I became a, a journalist with Daily uh, and things are much nicer, much nicer, I'll re take back my much, things are nicer in, in those places. So whether or not things are really getting better is a little hard to say, but they look nicer, the cities do look nicer. Don't they? Is that all? Maybe it is.